well, anyway, I heard about these two guys. They were two extremely rich, wealthy brothers. And they went to the same church. And uh, they, they put on appearances like they were good Christians, but really, they were both really rotten guys. And the pastor knew it, although the church people didn't know it. And then one of the brothers died. And uh, he passed away, and the surviving brother went to the pastor and said, Listen, pastor, here's the deal. I'm going to make a huge donation to the church in my brother's name. But there's one thing, there's one condition I want, and that is that when you do his funeral, I want you to tell everybody what a saint he was. I want you to tell everybody that my brother was a saint. The pastor says, okay, no problem. So the brother gives the pastor the check, and the pastor, as quick as he can, he hightails it to the bank and deposits the check. A few days later, it's time for the funeral, and the pastor stood up in front of the casket to give the eulogy. And uh, he points to the brother in the coffin, and he says, I just want to tell you that the man lying here was an absolute rat fink. He lied. He cheated. He stole. He pushed old ladies down. He stole candy from babies. And he's going on and on about how awful this brother was. He said, he's one of the worst people I ever met. And meanwhile, the surviving brother sitting there listening, he's thinking, what the heck's going on here? This isn't what he said he was going to do. And after more, you know, he went on and on after several more minutes of railing on the dead brother, how awful he was. He says this, he says, but there's one thing I got to say for him. Compared to this brother that's still alive that's sitting here, he was a saint. <laughs> anyway. Join hands with somebody, if you can, after that. And let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the anointing to teach. I thank you for your spirit which now moves and flows among us and has been doing so. I ask you to just continue to bless as we preach and teach and share your word with each other. In Jesus' name, everybody says? Amen. Amen. Well, every once in a while I get a mishmash of things without a real theme, although they kind of interconnect because the Holy Spirit helps us with that. Uh, today, uh, I'm going to call this Things I've Been Wanting to Say. <laughs> Are you scared? Yeah. You should be very scared. <laughs> Things I've been wanting to say, wanting to talk about for a while, uh, and I can't fit them all into one. So the first thing I want to talk about just for a few moments is forgiveness. I had an experience this week I'm going to share with you, but before I do, does somebody have a microphone? I need a reader. Who's a good reader? Anybody? Here's a microphone. Steve, are you going to help yeah, me out? Yeah, sure. yeah, all right. I like having readers. I mean, I'd like you to read along with the person who reads, but it gives me a chance to take a little sip of my water. So put the first scripture up, 2 Corinthians 2, verses 5 through 11. Uh, 2 Corinthians 2, 5 through 11. Forgiveness for the offender. If anyone has caused grief, he has not so much grieved me as he has grieved all of you to some extent. Not to put it too severely, the punishment inflicted of him by the majority is sufficient. Now instead, you ought to forgive and comfort him so that he will not be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. I urge you, therefore, to reaffirm your love for him. Another reason I wrote you was to see if you would stand the test and be obedient in everything. Anyone you forgive, I also forgive. And what I have forgiven, if there was anything to forgive, I have forgiven in the sight of Christ for your sake. In order that Satan might not outwit, you, outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. All right, so what, what Paul is saying here is that he bestowed forgiveness on someone, not just for that person's sake, for his own, but really for the sake of the whole church. Forgiveness is a very powerful and impactful thing. And I'm often surprised at how Christians who really love the Lord have trouble with forgiveness. They struggle with it. And I've had Christians, church-going consistent Christians tell me I'm not going to forgive that person. What they did was too awful and I, I don't care. I don't really care. I don't care what the word says. I don't care what Jesus said. I don't care what you say. 
I'm not going to forgive that person. And that's really a sad moment because I know how powerful and releasing forgiveness is. It's like a key that unlocks something in the spiritual realm. And when it's granted, it sets everything that's in disarray and back in order. It stops all conflict. It, it just ends the mess and brings serenity to the situation. Look at Proverbs 15.1. Read it with Steve there. A soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs up anger. I want to say this. A severely flawed... I mean, there are people that are severely flawed, and a lot of them are in the church right now. Isn't that right? I'm not naming names, but, you know, Jeff, you're... Up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> you're, yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, Jeff is much better than Ida. At least he'll tell you that he is. And, uh, but, you know, there are people that are severely flawed. And I had an encounter with one this week who has been really testing my patience and the patience of a lot of our, the people in our church. And severely flawed individuals will test your patience in, in conflict situations. Me, personally, I prefer fight to flight. Now, I know a lot of people don't like confrontation. Frankly, I've just had so much of it through the years, I have no problem with it. You know, if you want to come at me, you better come at me with both guns. And you better have, have a case, because if you come at me and you're wrong, I'll chew you up, spit you out, there will be nothing left of you, honestly. And that, that you know, just ask my, isn't that right, sweetheart? Yeah, just like, <laughs> yes. She knows. She often says to me, you, when you get mad, you scare me. Stop it. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, I had it out with the uh, cable guy the other day. You know, but yeah, just listen. I'm, I'm paying for this service. You're going to give me good service or we're going to throw your stuff out in the street. You know, I'm that kind of guy. Uh, but I had a situation where I had some words with somebody and they said a few things to me that really made me angry. They accused me of something that was not at all my heart. And uh, so they attacked me on Facebook, you know, and some of you probably saw that. And, uh, well, time goes by, and your anger starts to subside a little bit, and you, be, you pray, and you begin to think, what needs to happen here for the greater good? Because, frankly, when someone gets mad at me, uh, at my age, I just turned 60. By the way, there's a number six. Do you like my jacket, by the way? Yeah! My sons got me this jacket. They all went in, and on the back it says, uh, you know where the name is supposed to be? It says Pop. Uh -oh. And the number is 60, which means that I'm 60 years old. And, uh, and I love this jacket, by the way. It's really comfortable and nice. And, yeah, way to go, sons. Yeah. And... Uh, but anyway, uh, I have found that the greatest price of forgiveness comes uh, in the area of our own ego, our pride. And when you forgive someone, you also need to ask them to forgive you. And to ask someone for forgiveness who you feel is, and I don't mean to sound arrogant, but you understand, everybody doesn't have the same intelligence level, everybody doesn't have the same spirituality level. And when you're in a situation with someone who you know is inferior intellectually, spiritually, morally, and in every area, they're just, you know, struggling with life, and you feel like the Lord is telling you, you have to ask forgiveness of them, you can't just say, I forgive you. You know, it's kind of arrogant. I had a guy come to me one day, and one of the guys, he was a singer in our church, and he came to me and he says, you know, I've been really mad about, at you about something for a long time, but I just want you to know I forgive you. Don't ever say that to anybody. That's a horrible, mean, stupid thing to do, all right? It's very, un, it's not humble in the least, okay? When you approach somebody and you want to establish reconciliation, you have to be willing to humble yourself in hopes that they'll humble themselves as well. And so I came to this person and, uh, you know, and I just said, listen, I want to apologize to you for any way that in that conversation that I hurt you. Even though he came at me first and I responded, uh, we are human. We're all fallible. 
And you know, you may be in a situation with someone right now where they've done this much wrong to you, all kind of rotten stuff. They've talked about you, blah, blah, blah. But even if you do this much in comparison, can you all see? You still have something that you can ask forgiveness for. It's really hard. It's hard in those situations because they've wronged me this much. They've hurt me so bad and they've talked about me. And I, you know, and I have to apologize. And the Lord just put that on my heart that that's really the only way that you can establish reconciliation with someone. And the Lord, the Holy Spirit's speaking to right now. There's some of you that have a situations with your kids. And you really need to, if you want to bring peace to that, you truly, from the heart, need to humble yourself. I don't care what they've done to you. They're, you're the older, they're the younger. This is a prophetic word I'm getting right now from the Holy Spirit. You're the older, they're the younger. You have to be the bigger person in those situations. I see so many situations where the kid has to be a bigger person than the parent, and that's just not right. Why are you forcing your kid into that thing? You need to go to them. Say, listen, I'm sure I made mistakes and I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. I want you in my life. It's really not hard. It's just, it's when you have to do these things, the Holy Spirit puts it on you. It's crushing to your pride. It's crushing to your soul. Remember we had the circles on screen a couple weeks ago. I taught about the three parts of man. This is the body, then there's the soul, and then that soul is that middle part of your personality and your emotions and what you think and how you feel, your mind and your will, the choices you make, all of that's in that part of you. And when you have to do something like that, it's crushing to that soul. But here's the thing. Remember the deepest part was, was what? The spirit. Your spirit is the deepest part of your being. The soul oftentimes is what interferes with us operating out of the spirit. You, are you with me so far? And so when you have to apologize in that kind of situation, it's, it's a breaking of sorts to that soul. But here's the thing, when your soul gets broken up a little bit, it allows more of the spirit to come out. How many of you know this? You go through stuff, and it crushes your person, you know, like, and yet it makes you move deeper. Now, some people get angry and they get moved to the outer realms. Instead of going, they, they make their soul stronger and they get angry and they hold on to that anger and that resentment. I'm going to tell you, anger and resentment is only going to kill you quicker. And while you're alive, you're not going to have peace. Just break down for goodness sakes and say you're sorry. You go first. Did you hear me? You go first. Stop waiting for that other person to go first. You know what that is? That is simply pride, arrogance. Pride comes before a fall. You go first. You be the first. I contacted this person. They didn't contact me. The person attacked me on Facebook and did some and said things that were kind of rotten to me. I went first. Boy, I hated it. Listen, I'm going to warn you right up front. You're going to hate it. Yeah. <laughs> you are. You're going to hate picking up the phone or making the appointment or having the. You're going to hate every second of it. But when you're done, it'll bring you a peace and calm that wasn't there before to your spirit and that's what I want to say about apology and forgiveness it's very important to err is human to forgive is what? divine, divine. so true the fivefold ministry I want to talk to you about the fivefold ministry because there's so much misunderstanding I have people tell me oh I've got the gift of apostling or the gift of you know evangelism or whatever and there's so I'm going to give a little teaching on what is called, is known, um, and it's a name for a particular passage, but the fivefold ministry gifts. Look at Ephesians 4, 8. Let's read that, Steve. Therefore it says, when he ascended on high, 
He led captivity captive, and he bestowed gifts on men. All right, so who is the he in this scripture? Hmm? Jesus. And it says, when he ascended on high, this is after he was crucified and resurrected, he led captivity captive, and it says he bestowed gifts on men. What are these gifts? Look at Ephesians 4, verse 11 now, and read, and read that. And his gifts to the church were varied, and he himself appointed some as apostles, special messengers, representatives, some as prophets who speak a new message from God to the people, some as evangelists who spread the good news of salvation, and some as pastors and teachers to shepherd and guide and instruct. All right, so these gifts we're talking about are people. These are not abilities, okay? These are people. The apostle, everybody say it with me, the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, the pastor, and the teacher. Okay, go ahead and read on, and we're going to see what these people are supposed to be doing. What is their job? And he did this to fully equip and perfect the saints, God's people, for their works of service to build up the body of Christ, the church. All right, stop right there. So the job of these ministers, we'll call them ministers from here on out. These specially gifted ministers, their job is to prepare, it's not their job to do all the works of service, but to prepare God's people for their works of service in the body. Okay, go ahead, Steve. Until we all reach oneness in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God, growing spiritually to become a mature believer, reaching to the measure of the fullness of Christ, manifesting his spiritual completeness and exercising our spiritual gifts and unity. All right, so our job is to also mature the body of Christ, bring them up to the full stature of Jesus. All right, go ahead. So that we are no longer children, spiritually immature, tossed back and forth like ships on a stormy sea and carried about by every wind of shifting doctrine. By the cunning and trickery of unscrupulous men by the deceitful scheming of people ready to do anything. All right, how many of you know that there are people posing as ministers out there that really, they, you know, when, if you meet them personally, the first thing you want to do is put your hand on your wallet. <laughs> and the second thing, put your arm around your wife. There are people out there. How many of you know that, that they're, yeah. And, and let's go on. Go ahead and read some more. But well, excuse me, our job is to protect you from them, the likes of them. All right, go ahead. But speaking, but speaking the truth and love in all things, both our speech and our lives expressing his truth, let us grow up in all things into him following his example, who is the head Christ. Yes, go ahead. From him, the whole body, the church, and all its various parts, joined and knitted firmly together by what every joint supplies. When each part is working properly, causes the body to grow and mature, building itself up in unselfish love. That's our job, to get you doing that, working as a team, where nobody just stands out and says, oh, look at me, 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 but everyone contributes a part, and that's when the, the body flourishes, when everybody brings their contribution. It's really a wonderful thing. All right, so let me talk about this for a few minutes. These, quote, gifts, they're not attributes. They're not abilities that God gives to everybody, like a talent for art or, or cooking or music or whatever. It's an anointing. These gifts are actually individuals that are distinctly called by God with an anointing from the Holy Spirit to stand in one or more, sometimes people stand in more than one, but of these five We'll call them offices, okay? The office of the pastor, the office of the prophet. They're, they're people that God has called and anointed to be that. It's not just what they do, it's what they are. And they minister under the unction and the power of the Holy Spirit in that way, consistently, with great presence to the body of Christ. Now, someone can stand up and give a sermon or a sermonette and do a good job, but when a prophet is standing in the pulpit, I'm going to tell you, you know it. They have a presence about them. When a true pastor is standing in the pulpit, you know it. There's a, a gift for shepherding and teaching that is it's stronger than the average person. 
and it flows consistently. The evangelists the same way, they, their heart is just for the loss, and you know when there's a true evangelist, not just someone who's evangelistic. All right, so these ministers are given by Christ. It should be, this should be up on screen, right? These ministers are given by Christ to prepare and equip God's people for their works of service. They're not supposed to do all the work of the ministry. They exist to help you. These are not five jobs you can learn. This is important that you know that because I have people tell all the time, oh, God's called me to be an apostle or whatever. And I want to tell you something. If someone's called, the fruit is there and it's easy to behold. When they walk into a room, everybody knows it. When they take the pulpit, everybody knows it. Okay, These are not five jobs you can learn. You cannot call yourself to one of these five offices. It's a great mistake in my mind. I've seen people with gift lists, okay, and you can get books on this stuff. Uh, you know, I think, uh, I can't think of the guy name, guy's name right now. It was really big on this, but they lump them all together. All the gifts in one. Oh, this is a gift of exhorting, and this is the gift of pastoring. This is the gift of, uh, discerning of spirit and no the, there's different lists of gifts in the Bible for a reason okay and to these are the gifts given by Jesus in Romans 12 you see gifts that are given by the Father and they're completely different they're, it's not those are not people gifts those are foundational or creational gifts you see in first Corinthians 12 the gifts of the Spirit no, those are given by the Holy Spirit and they're manifest, and it says anyone can manifest the, a gift of the Spirit any time. Not anyone can be a pastor. Not anyone can be an apostle. And it's not up to you whether you are or not, okay? There are very few, you can't call yourself to one of these five offices, and there's very few of these people walking the earth in relation compared to the rest of the population. God sets them in the body as it pleases him. It is completely God's decision who stands in those offices and it's immutable. And part of the problem, well, I'm not going to get ahead of myself. Just because a person prophesies sometimes doesn't make him a prophet. If you lead someone to the Lord once in a while, it doesn't make you an evangelist. Are, are you following with me? Are you tracking with me so far? It's important that we understand these things. If you're a caring, nurturing person, a good exhorter, a good public speaker, it does not make you a pastor. Okay? These five types of ministers are named in order and in rank and the greatness of their gift, the, the power of, of the gift. And I want to use the hand illustration to help you remember what they are and how they function. This is going to be real simple. Everybody take your hand, your right or your left hand, whichever you use best. All right. You got your thumb, right? The thumb is going to be the apostle. The pointing finger is going to be the prophet. Middle finger is going to be the evangelist. The this ring finger is going to be the pastor, and the pinky is going to be the teacher. Okay. Now, I'm going to save the apostle for last, and I have a reason for that. So let's go to number two, which is what? What was number two? The prophet. All right. The prophet. The pointing fig finger signifies that he hears the voice of the Lord better than other Christians and his job is to give directive messages straight from the heart of God via the Holy Spirit to the body of Christ. Often in a prophecy it contains a lot of the, a lot of the word, a lot of scripture, but it's not uh, scripture in the sense of logos, which is the Greek, it's sim logos simply the written established word, or established forever. It, when the prophet speaks, he brings a current word right from the heart of God to the body of Christ or to an individual person for that moment in time. It has to be current, it has to be from God's heart, and it has to be for that moment to you individually. And you've seen in our church individual prophecies. You've also seen corporate prophecies given to the whole body of Christ. The evangelist, that's the longest finger. And it means that his burden is to reach out beyond the church and reach out to the lost. He wants to get them saved. He wants to bring them into the church so they can be discipled and become part of God's family. That's what evangelists do. Then comes the pastors, number four, which is which finger? The ring finger. And that's significant because 
The pastor, in a sense, is married to the church. He's Christ's representative to the church. Of course, Christ is the great bridegroom. And his heart beats to encourage and establish people in their faith. He has to be a good teacher. And that's why in the scripture, I don't know if you noticed this, but when Steve read the, the list of these five ministers, it says some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists. Then it says some to be pastors and teachers. It doesn't say some to be pastors and some to be teachers. Some to be pastors and teachers. There's a strong uh, indicative connection there. The, and, I, and I believe that divinely called pastors must also stand in the office of teacher because that's a lot of what we do. We teach the word. Okay, does that make sense to you? But fivefold teachers don't necessarily have to be pastors. You can understand why. Pastors must be able to stand in the office of teacher. They must be an anointed teacher as well as a shepherding type of person. Now the teacher, the little finger, all right, everybody raise your hand, see a little the little finger brings balance to the hand. That's what the teacher does. The teacher brings the word. The teacher, an anointed teacher, wants to bring out the depth of the word. Okay, and this person is especially anointed and called. He's gifted to do this. He's not simply someone who's a skilled teacher. Like a, There's a lot of great school teachers. There's a lot of people that can stand up in a, a men's meeting or a women's meeting or a food minister and give a teaching. But the... Five-fold teacher has a, a large anointing to teach. What they teach is so, it's really deep and it, it lasts longer in the memory and the heart of the listener. And you've heard people that teach, it's just like, oh man, that's just, you know, your heart burns within you. Something erupts inside of you when they're giving their teaching from the word of God. There's a spiritual element to the five-fold anointed ministry of teacher, the person that's a teacher, that causes their teachings to pierce hearts, change lives, and you know it's more than just a human ability. It's an anointing from God. If you're new to the Lord, anointing simply means it's like the Holy Spirit comes on you to do it, and it's more powerful than just the average person doing it. Now, let's go back to number one, the apostle. Which finger was the apostle? The thumb. Everybody take your thumb now and touch your first finger, and then your second, your third, your fourth. All right, the thumb touches all the fingers on the hand. The apostle is the greatest of these gifts. It's ranked number one because the apostle can literally, before your eyes, become a prophet if needed. The apostle can become an evangelist if needed, you see? He be can become a pastor. He can become a teacher. Someone who stands in the office of the apostle can move interchangeably in the other four gifts, the ministry gifts, plus he has an anointing to lead, and people just tend to follow him. He's, the apostle tends to be a very strong-minded person, not easily swayed from convictions. And uh, if you only saw the guy once, and, he, and there was people that needed to be saved, you'd think that's an evangelist. But then you'd come the next week and he's prophesying, you think, well, that's a prophet. Well, no, the apostle does all of them. And that's why the apostle can be a leader to the other four, like other ministry gifts will follow an apostle because they sense that extra oomph that God's given them to lead and to establish things. They establish foundations in people's lives. They can start churches successfully. And so other prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers look to the apostle for leadership and for direction. Now, one other little tidbit about this. The worst thing you can do is to try and become something that you're not, okay? Be content with what God has given you. Let, let me just, I was talking with Danny about this a couple weeks ago, Pastor Danny. And I think if, if you've been listening to what I'm saying, you recognize pretty easily Danny stands in what office? Prophet. We call him Pastor Danny we call all of our associate pastors pastors because they're assistant pastors. In other words, they're here to assist the pastor. That's what but that doesn't mean, calling someone an assistant pastor doesn't address whether or not they have a five-fold calling. Okay. Danny's calling is pretty obvious. It's, a, it's profit. Okay. Um, 
I was talking with Danny about this. And people, a lot of people want to be one of these in the body of Christ. And part of the reason is because they see glory in it. They see, or they say, well, I could really serve God if I could just stand up there and do what, what that guy does. You know? How many of you have seen that before? Oh, yeah. And how many of you have seen somebody with, you know, oh, I'm a pastor, I'm going to start a church. They have no business starting a church. I'm a prophet, I'm a, and their prophecies are inaccurate, and they're foolish. They're running around hurting people that listen to them, you see. I'm an evangelist. Well, okay, you're really an evangelist. How many people have you led to the Lord this last year? But I have people telling me all the time, I'm an evangelist. Well, where's your souls? Where are the souls that are following you? Where's the disciples that you've made? See, <clears throat> not everybody stands in these offices. There's got to be fruit. I mean, when someone stands in one of these offices, there's extreme fruit that is visible for all to see. Amen, Jimmy? You know what I'm talking about. So the worst thing you can do, it's dangerous to you, it's dangerous to others to try and call yourself to a ministry because you see, what I was talking with Danny about is it's, if people really knew the suffering that's involved, how attacked, you know, you get attacked and persecuted and betrayed and double-crossed and all the time. It's just the enemy will stir anybody up who's a weak link to come against you, you know. We had a little thing recently here, you know, where someone did that and, you know, just kind of acted in a way that they weren't, um, you know, they were saying one thing, but then they were acting another way. And it hurt the body a little bit, and we just had to recover from that. That's, but that's what we go through. When I go to sleep, you know, when you go to sleep, you think about, oh, your job, what you did. When I go to sleep, I see all of your faces. You know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. When you don't come and you don't call or text, I'm thinking about you. Where is son? I'm praying for you. You know, how are they doing? Are they okay? You know, and that kind of thing. Uh, Uzziah was a king. He was a terrific king in the Old Testament. Did anybody know the story about Uzziah? One day he decided that oh, it's not enough to be a king. I'm going to call myself to be a priest. God didn't call him to be a priest. He called himself. People that are even in the fivefold ministry, they have to be careful. If you're called to be a prophet or an evangelist, or don't try and say, oh, I want to be that too. That's what Uzziah did, and guess what happened to him? You know, when he was king, he was anointed. And they, where do they anoint you in the Old Testament to be a king? Forehead, right. Well, the very place he was anointed, when he's, and the priests, by the way, if you read the story, they begged him, don't do this. God hasn't called you to be a priest dangerous he didn't listen to them i want to be a priest too he saw more glory so he went into the where he wasn't supposed to be and and how many of you know what happened to the guy what he got leprous and where did the here's the interesting thing where did the leprosy strike him first right on the same forehead where he had been anointed as king because he violated what god wanted for him and he tried to be something he wasn't his anointing turned into leprosy. Pretty uh, that's unfortunate. All right, so any, did anybody get anything out of that, the whole fivefold ministry? Good, I've got a couple more issues, and kind of, this kind of flows in the next thing that I've, I've been wanting. To, I've been wanting to say this to you for a long time. <laughs> Fatherhood. Fatherhood. And I'm not talking about human fatherhood. I'm talking about spiritual fatherhood. Read, uh, Steve, read 1 Corinthians 4.15. For even if you had 10,000 others to teach you about Christ, you have only one spiritual father. For I became your father in Christ Jesus when I preached the good news to you. There's a lot of people, and this was part of the issue we had recently that hurt the body a little bit. Um, there are people that they love glitz. They get sucked in by something that looks big and looks entertaining and charisma. And there are people that run after teachers and forget that they have a spiritual father who loves them. Read the next thing, if you would, Steve. I hope in the Lord Jesus to send Timothy to you soon, that I also may be cheered when I receive news about you. I have no one else like him, 
who will show genuine concern for your welfare. Did you see it, hear that? Paul said, I have no one else like Timothy. He's faithful. That's why I can send him. Go ahead and read the rest of that, Steve. For everyone looks out for their own interests, not those of Jesus Christ. But you know that Timothy has proved himself, because as a son with his father, he has served with me in the work of the gospel. And he said two very important things there in those. For number one, not everybody looks out for their, there's, everybody looks out for their own interests, but there's only a few that really look out for the interests of Jesus. If you're looking out for the interests of Jesus, you're also looking out for the interests of Sharia. You see, because you're part of Jesus' body. True ministers care about you. They don't care about themselves or how much money they make or how, much, how famous they are. True fathers care about their children, right? True pastors and spiritual leaders care about their flock in the same way. You don't want your kid to run out on the street because what might happen? It's hit. You want to teach your child as much as possible to prepare them for life. See, this is what beats in the heart of people who are spiritual fathers. You can tell the difference. Now, um, they may not be as dynamic. They may not be as exciting as but we live in an entertainment-oriented society. You follow what I'm saying? And so, and then he talked about Timothy, how like a son to a father, he worked with him for the sake of the gospel. Anybody that's called to be a leader, or a minister, they, they understand if they have any intelligence at all, they can't do it by themselves. They need people. The Apostle Paul himself had four, at least 47 people that we can count in the Bible that were part of his team. They were men and women. They were gifted. Some of them were pastors. Some of them were prophets. They had deacons, deaconesses. Phoebe was a deaconess. Okay. She was part of his team. She did all kind of, pra she was like a Sukar kind of person or a Jenny. Somebody you can just give something to and you know they're going to get it done like a Jennifer's. Here, I need you to do this. That's, you know, we have a number of Phoebes in our church. You see and you can't do what you are called to do without a team of people. And, so, and we're so grateful for, to God for all of you that are, you're part of this team. And it's a growing team, and it's a team that's reaching out and touching our community in so many ways. Which, and we're so excited about that. There are people, though, Christians, that have their priorities out of whack. They overvalue big-name preachers, and they undervalue spiritual fathers. That's why Paul was writing this. It was a plea to the church. Don't be taken in by all the glitz mongers and the money grubbers and understand you have a father here in Paul that cares for you. You see? And with the advent of TV ministries and Christian, it's like we've put it all together. Like, you know, Dave, what I'm talking about, celebrity. People go gaga over the sheer thing of celebrity. And now we've, we're seeing celebrities that are just saying some really vile and nasty things. And people are like, it does not compute. What do I do? Do I watch their movies? And those are choices you have to make. I mean, some celebrities, they've just really gone beyond the pale, as far as I'm concerned. I just have a hard time. They're just not even watchable to me anymore because of some of the things they've done over political issues and some of the crude things. You know, we had one comedian who uh, had a, a, you know, the, the head of the president severed with blood all over, and she's holding this thing up thinking that just in their arrogance that everybody's going to agree with her position. We have two major political parties here in this country. And even though you may not agree with people from the other party, we need to respect their right to have an opinion. But when someone assumes, which is happening a lot with celebrities, they assume that everyone thinks the way they do, they will come out and just basically call everyone who doesn't agree with them stupid. You're a moron, you're a hillbilly, you fell off the, tur you know, the turnip truck. I mean, this is what's happening here. And, and I don't care what party I'm a part of, and I don't care which party it's happening to, I find that extremely insulting and revolting. Because the scripture tells us in Romans, we're supposed to pray for our president, whoever he is, and all those who are in authority, and that is a, there's a measure of respect that needs to go along with that 
If you don't respect what the president's doing, you are at least called to respect his office, the office of president, you see. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to pray. If we prayed as much as we complained, we have a different country. Read uh, 2 Timothy 4 here, Steve. For, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they will heap up themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. A lot of itching ears today, isn't there? A lot. A lot of people heaping up for themselves teachers. This is happening a lot today. And, but I want to tell you, in 32 years, I've heard hundreds, literally hundreds of testimonies of people who ran after the glitz. They forgot that they had a spiritual father that loved them, and they ran after the glitz. And the testimonies that I've heard over and over again is that once they got there, no one really cared at all about them. These people didn't care about their well-being. You know what they cared about? Their money. And whatever they could do to serve that person's kingdom, okay? And that's not what fathers do. And these people, a lot of them, you know, in our church, we have people come back. They ran after the glitz. They got beat up, and they came back. And what they always say is, we felt really cared for here. We never felt that way when we ran after the big the big thing. Amen? Yeah. And, uh, yeah, they often got messed up. And I just wanted to repeat a scripture we read back with the fivefold. Every wind of shifting doctrine by the cunning and trickery of unscrupulous men, by the deceitful scheming of people ready to do anything for personal profit. That's unfortunate, but that's the reality. That's one thing I wanted to say. And then there's one last thing I wanted to talk about. I've got to get it off my chest today. Can I vent to you? Can I say what I'm really feeling today? Sure. <laughs> sure you can. We'll decide later whether we like you or not. Though. Uh, Proverbs 13. We want to talk to you about good character. Stephen, read Proverbs 13, verse 4. The soul of the sluggard craves and gets nothing, while the soul of the diligent is richly, richly supplied. All right. All right, here's the thing. As a... As a fivefold ministry gift as a spiritual father it's very important that I teach regularly and I talk about it in the messages often just good character because I'm dealing with a lot of people that just I don't want to insult your parents but you know either you weren't raised right or you didn't listen to your mom and dad because if you were raised right or you had a mom and dad that told you the right things you return your phone calls. You do everything you can to pay your bills. You keep your commitments. And you don't you just show up. You show up on time. You're punctual. You do a good job every day for your boss. You pay your tithes. You serve the Lord in the church. You're not afraid to commit to a local church because you understand that commitment is the way the pastor knows who is, he's shepherding. You're not afraid to roll up your sleeves and get involved in the kingdom of God. You see? And if I, can, if I can help you understand the value of good character, and I know some of you that have good character, you're looking at me like, wow, you really need to say this? Yeah, I do, because everybody's not you. I get stood up. You'd be shocked how often I get stood up for appointments. And they call me. You called me. I'm sitting here waiting for you. You made this appointment, right? Right. Uh, I call people. They don't call back. I have to call them five times, talk to them. That, ladies and gentlemen, is what's called bad character. And it's the very kind of thing that good fathers will confront in their children. It's bad character. Because we know something that if I can help you in the, see the value of character and, and try and improve in that area, I'm going to help you in every area of your life. I'm going to help you with, in your vocation, your job. I'm going to help you in all of your relationships. I'm going to be able to help you spiritually speaking. I'm going to help you in financial matters. I'll give you a couple of examples since I'm on my soapbox here. 
there will be people who do not come this Wednesday night. We're doing financial planning and Q&A. Even though they have financial problems, they will not show up Wednesday night. People with, and they know their finances are a mess, but they can't get off the, whatever, the cow, their blessed assurance. They can't get off of their, <laughs> get off your blessed assurance and, and make the track so that you can improve and start to save and start to, you know, just do better. And there's so, finances is such a multi, you know, it's got a lot of heads to it. And there's going to be real help for you here Wednesday. Even as I say this, I know that many who really need it. And yet, down the road, you'll apply for benevolence here. You won't make time to try and help yourself. You know what I'm talking about? There are people that just, they have become system dependent. And my job as a pastor is not to berate people, but to try and help them grow out of that if they weren't parented properly or if they just didn't listen you're older now you need to grow up that's what fathers say isn't it time to grow up kid what yeah you're going to start doing your own laundry what yeah clean up your messes right be you know learn responsibility and that's what good pastors and shepherds and leaders do as well I'll give you a, a recent example um, new members class we had people that gave their time and their effort to prepare food for the ones that signed up and yet half of the people that signed up did not show or call and you know who you are <laughs> people are looking around yeah that person over there yeah People took their time, volunteered to make food for you and to make you comfortable and set a table for you and all this. And you signed up for that and you didn't show or call. That is what we call bad character. Am I mad? No. Am, am I a good pastor? I think so. I'm trying to be right now because a lousy pastor would just enable you. Oh, it's okay. We know something probably came up. Fooey on that. I'm, a, I'm 60 years old, man. If I make a commitment, I keep it. Because I have good character. That helps me right down the line in everything else in life, okay? So I encourage you, man. Work hard. Be diligent. Love your wife. Pay your bills. Keep your commitments, for goodness. And be punctual. Yes, sir. It is. Truly is, Dan. That's, that is the truth. You can just kick your butt out of the, the sofa or the, your recliner. Did I say butt in church? I didn't mean to say that. You can just kick your blessed assurance out of your easy chair. And be where you said you're going to be. There's a scripture in Proverbs, Pastor Lee. You know it. It's the one that says... Uh, if you send somebody to do something and they don't do it, it's like smoke to the eyes and vinegar to the teeth. It's grating and annoying on people that are depending on you to just simply keep your word. Keep your word. King David said, I'm going to keep my word even if it hurts me. Made a commitment. Pastor Lee, I rem we, Gary comes in I, once a month on Fridays. I made a commitment to you, did I not? That I would be there. We've had two of them. Have I been there? On time. Or early, right? That's how you do life, isn't it, Pastor Lee? That's how you do life. That's how you become a Timothy, a son or a daughter in the faith, that a leader can say, I rely on that person. They said they're going to do it. I know it's going to get done. So we have a lot, we have Bernie's like that. I thought, Bernie says I'm going to do it. I just don't even think about it anymore. It's, it's going to happen. It happens quickly. He doesn't like, you know. Oh my gosh, we had a brother in our church one time. He was uh, he did repair work, contracting work, and 
he was hired by a couple, a nice couple. They made the mistake of paying this guy in advance. Crappy, oh, I'm sorry. Rotten character. Terrible character. Didn't show. Kept him waiting. Then we did, did a terrible job. He did half the job. Months went by. These people just hired, they were too nice to even ask for their money back. He wouldn't have given it anyway. And he lives his life that way. Um, and if you're listening, brother, I hope you've shored up your character. Because that, that was hurtful to that older couple. And see, that's the kind of things that ought not to happen in the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. Yeah, and that's why I don't give anybody all the money up front. Ever. Ever. Yes. Correct. That's right. Yes, Pastor. You know, pastors, we prepare school with young people for careers in vocational education. And when I meet with industry and present kids with them, the main thing they ask me is about the character of the kids. That's correct. Does he know this? Does he know that? And yes. What kind of a person is he? And can I depend on Yes. And we, that's, where, that's where the breakdown comes. Yes, sir. I've been an employer since 1981. I had a business, and as a church, we've employed secretaries and maintenance people and all. You know, I've been an employer. That's the first thing I look for is character in a person. If you want a job, that's the first thing that the, they're going to look for. They're going to look at your history. They're going to call you. Isn't that right, Mike? You, call pre, you know, you have a business. Call previous employers. You want somebody who's going to show up and show up on time and give you a good day's work. They owe you that. You're, help, you're helping them with their, well, their whole life. You're, isn't that right? Their livelihood, okay? So listen, I mean, I could tell you so many stories. I had a young lady in the church, and, um, and I don't have anything against tattoos. You know, tat, they're fine. Huh? Yeah, but she, was, uh, she wanted a job. She asked me for help, and I had, was good friends with the guy who owned a store, and I sent her over there. And I... Th- I get the feeling that maybe she didn't want the job because she showed up sleeveless and there was, you know, a lot of tats up and down her arms. Well, she's selling a high ticket item. You know, it's carpeting, flooring, it's a lot of money. And so the owner called me and he said, Mike, she's a nice girl, but we're selling $5,000, $10,000 jobs, you know, and she, you know, she really should have worn long sleeves to this, you know, applying for the job. If she'd have worn long sleeves, I'd have hired her. You know, so when you deal with employers, you have to understand that they look at appearance. All right, I had one of my boys one time, Dad, can I get an earring? He was 13. I said, sure, son, you can have an earring when you can crawl over my cold, dead body to get one. Now, I'm not against earrings. I would, guys, I'm not against that. I don't care. What I, do whatever. Do the bling thing. But I'm just going to tell you, in that time, now he's 32 now, okay? At that time, people will not hire you. I'm just helping you practically here. People will not hire you over appearance issues, and they'll never tell you that. They don't have to. They just will hire the other person who, who dressed appropriately and, you know, looks better for make their company look better. I'm trying to help you here, okay? Now, you know what my, that son does now? Matthew's our second born. He works, works at Goodyear. He makes $120,000 a year. He doesn't, still doesn't have an earring. <laughs> my thing is why risk it? If you really want a job and you want to make good money, why risk it? Because you got to you know, show your individuality. Well, that's fine. I'll sh- and as an employer, I'll show you mine by not hiring you. How many of you know what I'm saying? All right. So I'm not putting down tats or piercings or anything like that. I'm just speaking about practicalities here. I want you to grow. I want you to be blessed. I want you to advance in every area. So consider those things. And, and part of this is just intelligence. And nobody's told me, there's a lot of people, maybe in this room, Nobody's ever told you this. You walk into a job opportunity, if it's a good job, and you got a big grill on your teeth, 
you're done. I didn't know totally what a grill is, but it's like you're, you're asking to not be hired. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. One out of every five zillion people become rap stars, and the rest of you are just unemployed. <laughs> it's the truth. You can dress like a rap star. Well, you better make it, because nobody's going to hire you to do anything else if you have that look. Yes, sweetheart. Yes. That is correct. Yes. Years and years ago, I was we were tough in a tough spot financially. We were doing foster care, and our, one of our foster kids left, and it was Christmas. I didn't have money for gifts, so I got an extra job delivering pizzas for Pizza Hut. I was pastoring, and I would do that in the evening. This is a long time ago. And I walked in, and at that time, you might remember when you were little, I had a full the full beard. And the first thing he said to me is, you seem like a nice guy, I'd like to hire you, but the full beard has to go. He said, you're in luck. We just changed our rule that you can wear a goatee now, but not the full beard. Well, I wanted the job, so what did I say? No problemo. Got the razor. And that's how I had this goatee, because I, when I did the goatee thing, my wife looked at me, she thought I was hot. <laughs> so, she said, oh, honey, I like that better. I said, I'm keeping this. That's right, baby. All the help I can get, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Praise God. Anyway, how many of you got something out of this today? Was this good? I'm glad. Did you learn, so you feel like you know something more about the fivefold ministry and how that operates and spiritual fatherhood? And, and I just ask you, work on your character, really. Keep your word because you're only as good as what your word is. And if your word isn't any good, you can fill out the rest of that sentence. Amen. All right, praise the Lord. Well, let's just pray for a moment and let's see if the Lord has anything else before we leave. Thank you, Father. Yes, indeed. Wow. Holy are you, Lord. Holy are you. Jesus, Jesus, you're so wonderful. You're so blessed. You're so holy. Amen. No, I think I'm done. I feel like the Holy Spirit's saying the word is, you know, God will anoint a certain aspect sometimes of a service more. Sometimes he'll anoint the worship more. Sometimes they'll anoint the word more. and Sometimes it'll be the altar ministry. But today, though, I feel like the Lord is saying what he wanted to accomplish, he accomplished through the preaching of the word today. So, stand up with me. And I want to just release you and bless you to have a wonderful Mother's Day. I'm sure you, some of you have plans. Some of your plans involve good food. My plans involve Chinese food in some way, shape, or form today. <laughs> As long as mommy wants, what's that? We had Chinese last night. Oh, that's hey Mother's Day, you know. If my, that's a, whatever my wife wants today, she gets. If she wants chicken, whatever, Amen. Mom, whatever Mama wants, Mama gets today, right, Goldie? Amen. Amen. I bless you all in the name of Jesus. You have a wonderful day. Don't forget Wednesday we've got Joel Wazdy coming. If nothing else, support this brother. He's the son of one of our new members, and that would be great. So we love you. Have a great day. You too, buddy. Enjoy your... Love you both.